I remember there was a time when I got a, gr a good assignment from um, one of my reps and and I had just, they had given me the wrong dose of medication because I'm so tiny, I'm about 85 pounds and I guess they just gave me too much. <laughs> so I was throwing up from, I guess, over being over medicated and I was throwing up so much that I had petechial hemorrhaging like all over my face and my eyes. Um, from, from the pressure of throwing up. And then I got the call and I had this throbbing headache. And she said, well, aren't you happy? And I, I first of all, like, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> like, jump up and down? Because it, it, it just, there was such a disconnect because she knew what I was going through. Um, but for some reason, I was supposed to just kind of snap out of that moment. I, mean, I, I guess she didn't understand, um, the gravity of the situation, I, I don't know, but um, it was one of those moments where I realized that I really couldn't, I was very alone in, in, in my own journey and no one really understood it unless it was very physical, unless it, you could outwardly show signs that you were in distress, um, a lot of people couldn't understand it. You have to be emotionally present when, as a food, as a as a journalist, you know, you, you can't be disconnected from the people you're interviewing or the people you're photographing. There has to be some sort of empathy there. And I had anhedonia at that time, which is just you know this lack of of being able to feel anything. Um, and so it was very hard to do my job in that sense because I couldn't I couldn't feel joy, pain. Empathy. There was just nothing there. I was pretty much a shell. It was very numb. Um, so that was, I think, the hardest part of the job is that um, an ability to to connect with the subjects. Um, but also, you know, like the physical aspect that you, you're constantly tired, lots of headaches, um, with the titration of the medication, the dosage of the medication. Um, so I think in the span of a year, I only took like three jobs and I pretty much like the burden fell on Ben to take care of us. As a photographer you have to make that image right then and there and we have to use every bit of our soul um, in order to tell us when to take when to make that image. Um, and that's where the emotion comes in. That's where it, it, your, your heart feeds your brain so that you understand, okay, here I am in this space. I have to understand how to be intimate with this subject and to create an image that will go with an 8,000 word piece. Like, how do I tell this person's story in one superficial, you know, construct? And that's where the uh, emotion part of, uh, because you have to relate to who you're photographing okay. in order to create that. Yeah. I am surprised, I guess, when it comes to the specific details of the people that come up to me because you don't expect, you know, that specific person to have a problem. But I'm also not surprised that that many people have come up to me and said, you know, thank you for telling your story, guess what, and you know, they, they give me a rundown of their story. I, I would say, like, journalism as an industry, probably has an overwhelmingly large amount of people with mental health issues considering what we do. Um, and, and, and you can go across the gambit of um, journalism. Is it gambit or gambit? Whatever. Um, you know, journalism. you can go across it and, and, and um, you know, whether you know, whatever aspect of, of what people do within in journalism. But I think we're all plagued by s some of the same issues. Like, you can't be a journalist without being a human being. But for the very same, to, to go back to the same question you asked about being unbiased, like, but then you're turning off your human being thing. And, and I think that haunts people. I mean, personally, like, a lot of folks that I know who were with me in Iraq or Afghanistan, like, we're all fucked up. Just as bad as 
any soldier. Maybe in a very different way. No, we all have PTSD. Well, but I think, think just but as I, bad as right. any soldier. I th no, I'm saying in, in general. But I, I think there's, there's a different way where we go about it because as a journalist who goes to cover a conflict zone, you know that you want to see death. You know that you're going to see death because that's what you're supposed to be covering. If I go to a conflict zone and no one dies, well then I've wasted my time as a conflict journalist. So I think what we take home is much more of, of, of on the guilt side. I, I never took anyone's life, but I made my career out of photographing people dying. So someone had to die. Something bad had to happen for me to make a good image or for someone else to write a story. And I think that's part of what plagues, you know, our industry a little bit is, is, is maybe the, the PTSD or the, the mental health that comes with, you know, issues that arise out of, out of shame. It's, it's a hard industry, you know. There are so many stresses. The hours are long. Um, the pay isn't that well. And if you're a freelancer... And if, you, and, and if people don't trust you, then it hits you personally. Because when you make an image or when you write a story, it's a little part of your soul. Right? The, it, it's not like being... And I'm, I mean, accountants are going to be upset at me, but it's not like being an accountant. It's like they tally up these numbers. But if you put five photographers in a room and say, take a picture of you know, a glass of water on this podium, everyone's going to try and do it differently. Because all of a sudden you know there are other photographers and everyone has an ego and they try and put their own little style in it. And when you say, oh, this picture of the glass of water is great, but these other four, shit. Well, those other four photographers are going to take it deep into their heart because they put their soul into trying to make this image. And so you're judged not on the quality of your work, but also, like, the work is part of you. And it can affect you very deeply, regardless of you know, what genre it is. When I came back from Iraq, the first time I had worked for the New York Times, they had offered counselors. I, I think the problem with, with journalists is most of us um, have some transient lives. Um, you know, no one really has a nine to five. So your social circle is really um, other, other journalists. Um, and the support group that you're talking about exists as, as this traveling you know, cadre of people, and that's part of the problem is that you don't see the same people every day. You don't, if you, Marvy didn't ever have to leave the house to go to a job, so she just didn't. So her support group ended up vanishing, and I think that's one of the things that makes the, kind of like mental health and support within the world of journalism a little bit more unique is because as freelancers, as journalists, we, we push our own stories. It's the things we see around the world that interest us. And when you can't move, when you can't get out, when something's haunting you, whether it's the flu or whether it's a, a, you know, a mental health issue, you're on your own. I think we also live in a time where in the last 10 years, the general Western public um, in first world internet savvy countries have gone from seeing 2,000 to 5,000 images in a day. We see so many images in a day that I think there's a general level of apathy that comes from an inundation of, of, of content. And so I think more people have grown more apathetic and, and you know, they're, they've been, you know, hardened against images because you see so many of them. Um, the, the picture of that little dead boy on the beach and who was fleeing Syria really bothered people. Um, and they just would repost it. Like, I've done my part. I've reposted it. It bothered me so much, this picture. It's, it's gone viral. The fuck does that mean? Did it change anything? Did people stand outside? And, and refuse to, to, to go on and to support governments not doing anything about Syria? No. It didn't, didn't change anything. Um, people today, um, 
mask this idea that like they really care or that it's affected them by like reposting it or talking about it online. I I I, I don't think it affects them mentally. I just think no one gives a shit about it, anyone anymore. Well, one in twenty started kind of organically in a way because. I knew I, I wanted to do something with my story. Um, at first, th my story, what, what I went through, uh, you know, with depression and my other mental health issues, was just a visual diary. You know, Ben gave me the camera and said, document this. You know, this is how you communicate, this is how you express yourself, just document what you're going through. Um, so that was just a visual diary for me. It was just my way of kind of taking myself out of the situation and kind of looking at my situation from another perspective. You know, when you look at a photo of yourself and you can see yourself or you can see your experiences, you process it very differently. It's kind of like an out-of-body experience. And so that was a way for me to reflect on what I was going through and kind of understand it. I just study that's kind of how I process the world. I study things visually or, you know, I connect to things emotionally, you know, when I see them. And so I just documented, visually documented my, um, the, you know, the whole process of, of my illness and um, healing, I guess, is what you would call it. Um, but then I started showing it to people in my group um, and they really, really related to it. And I remember one person said that, you know, she said thank you because she didn't feel like she was such an anomaly. Um, which meant, and that was the one thing that really hit me, is that, oh my god, I actually affected someone. Which is not anything that I've ever accomplished as a journalist. You know? There was a really significant moment that happened to me during um, my therapy group when I showed them my, you know, my visual diary on depression, and they said that they, first of all, they said thank you, and, and in, in a very sincere, very emotional way, um, because they, they felt, they didn't feel like they were an anomaly, and then another one was when I was. I had a show in Australia, and someone just came up to me um, when I was, we were at a restaurant, and someone came up to me and asked me if I was the person who did, you know, who had the exhibit, and they said, I can't even begin to tell you. I'd never really understood it when people said, this changed my life, but this changed my life. That was the first time that I'd ever, after th that show, that was the first time that I've ever spoken to anyone about what I was going through. And we talked all night and she has convinced me to go see a doctor. And this was coming from a doctor. This guy was a doctor. Um, and that I felt more than journalism was the kind of storytelling that I wanted to do. And I think that opened me up to, that, to the possibility that that is where I belonged. And so I um, ended up meeting a, a whole bunch of people that wanted to do the same thing, Carrie Payne, Lorena Ross, Deb Davis. And um, we just, and obviously Ben and I were already mulling this over, and we ended up, you know, just forming this little cooperative called One in Twenty. And basically the aim is just to change the narrative of the way we talk about mental health issues and the way we open up about what we are going through, there's still so much stigma that's going on, without realizing that pretty much everyone is going through not the same thing, but something. Because of what I've been through in the past, I think I had a, um, an insight in, into what Mari was going through, and I didn't walk away. Um, and it was really, really hard. Um, on, on me and, and lonely and lonely um, and I dealt with it in, in my own way but um, but our marriage didn't end and 
uh, where so many others do. Um, and we have friends who were no longer our friends because they didn't know how to be our friend while they were going through this. And, uh, and I think that's something, like I, my PTSD, what w- affected me coming back from war is like I have no fucking patience for anyone at all. Like you don't want to get in a car with me because I drive like a maniac. And if you're even going, you know, a little bit slower than you should be, uh, I'll run you off the road. Um, but, but like, who? The only person I have insane amount of patience for is is, is Marvy. Um, because I can look past everything else, and I know what she was going through, and I know what I have been through, and and because I have that understanding, um, it, it it just works. And I think that's what we need for for mental health and it's not just for journals it's for everyone it's like we live in this world where we're not patient with anyone or we we turn this blind eye to someone who doesn't to people to things that don't necessarily directly affect us and and we don't have patience for things that don't work out in the way that we want it to and I think if we just understood some of what other people were going through that maybe, and I'm not even being an I- idealist when I say this, because I'm not, but like, maybe it just makes the world a little bit better. It's like, how many of us just keep on walking down the street when you see a beggar or a homeless person and just ignore them? Um, whenever we're on the subway or the underground or whatever, you just go right past it. You, But if you knew what they were going through, you know, and it makes you a little bit more human that you can reach out to them. And I think that's part of where we're going here with 1 in 20 is getting people on all the different spectrums of mental health loss, the people suffering, their loved ones. Caregivers. Their caregivers. Like, getting them all interconnected and understand what each of them are going through. Right. Just to have a dialogue. Because, I, you know, ultimately it's, it's dialogue in general which solves not just mental health problems, but the world's problems. You shouldn't keep it within you. That's, you, it's like a festering boil that it will just get infected and become worse. One of the things is like, if you're a journalist, um, Always you're, the best analogy. Sorry. Uh, you, you're a communicator. Uh, so, use your talents to communicate what you're going through. And it doesn't, I mean, and that's, it doesn't have to be to anyone else. It's like, it could be through photography, it could be through a journal, it could be through a drawing, it could be through something that you write just in a journal for yourself. But you start pouring it out of you, that is the first step. You know, it's like creating a, um, you know, a, 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 pin, a, pin, a, a pin cushion for your soul. Like, just something to get out of you. If you're not ready to go see a therapist, or you're not, you don't think you need to, but you still wake up being dragged down by things that are haunting you, well, find a way as a communicator, as an artist, because in a way journalists are artists, um, to express yourself. And I think that's at least, at the very least, a first step to, to you know, getting out there. Some people um, are too proud to admit have an issue or some people play everything close to their chest or you know um, they're not open about what they're going through like some people learned I think maybe the older generation learned to not be as open about what they're going through like and it's probably harder for for those people to admit that there's something wrong but they can admit it to themselves they just don't have to admit it to someone else so start talking about it to yourself. I mean, that's, that is something that I think could work um, wonders for, for people, depending on who they are, but it's, it's a step. I would say that it's not, doesn't define you. It, it is what it is, what you're going through. When someone has diabetes or when someone has uh, a heart ailment, 
they just go through the process of getting it taken care of. Mental health issues, your mental illness, it doesn't have to define you.